Hello and welcome to Bostonian Wrap. My name is Rachel Meiselman and I will be your host for this evening. I am very fortunate to have as a guest tonight Rav Zazula. He is a Republican activist and consultant. We will discuss a myriad of issues on tonight's show, including voter ID, past elections, 2013, as well as GOP prospects for the year 2014. Ralph, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. So let's just get right into it. Um, Massachusetts, you know, I, I nearly said Boston, but Massachusetts in general, people have this idea that it is a very, very blue state, and so it's a very, very liberal state. And so we've actually had conversations, the two of us, before, and if people know the history of Massachusetts, Republicans actually played a very big role in legislature and very prominent until I would say the mid-1950s. 57. 57, right. <clears throat> so what would you say that, because you're actually not coming from the outside. You're you're from here. You're a Chelsea native, I believe. Correct. So, so comment on and, that. And grew up a Democrat. I mean, you, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Jewish. You're, you were born into the Democratic Party. You didn't right, I knew about Democrat. that. <laughs> um, and we were uh, pretty active. I had an uncle that was active in city politics in, in Chelsea. And we participated in that. The family moved to Medford, but my dad uh, kept a, a drugstore in Chelsea. So, you know, Chelsea was home. Chelsea is where I felt comfortable. It's a wonderful place. It is. It, 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 it's a great place. I mean, bagels alone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what, what happened to Massachusetts? What happened to Ralph Sazula? I mean, I, I was a, a Democrat until Richard Nixon. And um, I feared Richard Nixon being elected. I watched him uh, become president. And then I watched the way he behaved, and I was pretty impressed. And I thought, well, this is, this is not the person I feared. What, why is it that I had such bad information about him? So I really began to ask questions about, you know, what is a Republican? What is a Democrat? Why the difference? And by the time I was done looking at those things, I found out that I was a Republican. Uh, people in this state don't always have real good reasons. There are probably more people that are members of a party because their parents were. Absolutely. Uh, so what happened in... What in, they hear yeah, around them. You know, uh, and, and again, there are some blocks that were Democrats long before the 1950s. Jews typically in, in Boston sure. uh, would have been um, Democratic since uh, the 18th century. A lot of my family, sure. Yeah. Uh, so th these were things that we were surrounded with, and we weren't uh, taught that Democrats were uh, a, a way of doing things. The Democrats were right, the Republicans were wrong. So is, is that still true today? Are we taught what to think of things, or are we taught what these parties really stand for? I think that's a problem. There are people that have real conservative views today, uh, but they find themselves being Democrats because they were taught that. That's right. The changeover occurred. And, and, that's, and I'm glad you said that because I remember a few years back talking to fellow Republicans who are not from Massachusetts and they were just categorically writing Democrats off. Now, first of all, I would never do that because I grew up with people, a wide variety of people who had all kinds of different political beliefs. But it wasn't only because of that, but I also knew that there were some Democrats who were very conservative. Mm -hmm. quite conservative, just as conservative <laughs> as some Republicans who are running around in this state. And so when I shared that, you know, people were kind of surprised, well, one person in particular, I should say, and all of a sudden then he started talking about, okay, well, uh, you know, we should do outreach not only then to Republicans and conservative independents, but also conservative Democrats too. And you and I kind of sat back and I said to myself, you know, if you want to take a leading role in politics here in the Bay State, you should at least learn the history mm -hmm. of the state that you've come to. And so it's not only understanding and realizing that there are plenty of Democrats that are actually moderate or conservative in this state, in this city, Boston, um, but also, as we were just 
is saying that Republicans played a very big role in the legislature until 1957. Well, and governorships, I mean, right, right, the Republicans were the party to be right into the 1950s. And give the Democrats some credit. They didn't go out and teach the public to be liberal and present themselves as a liberal alternative. Uh, they played politics well, and they ran people that would have made great Republicans as Democratic politicians. And they played the game well, and they, and they established themselves. In the 1960s, nationwide, the Democratic Party became a juggernaut. And they began to hold uh, uh, the Senate and, and the House, especially the Senate, you know, for just this massive period of time. Well, during that period, things have changed. Sure. And, and, and again, people forget the past. Today, if you told people that it was the Republicans that were formed uh, to abolish slavery and that uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican president first. That shocks a lot of people. There, there's even a, a college campus in the United States that has a statue of Abraham Lincoln up calling him a Democratic president. I, the country needs an education in, in what the basics are. So the first thing that happens today is are Republicans Republicans and are Democrats Democrats? Uh, are Republicans true to the idea of uh, abolition of, of slavery? Sure. Do they care about that anymore? Uh, Republicans typically are, are dedicated to the idea that government should not be unrestrained, unchecked, and allowed to run over people's lives. Do, do our Republicans today, our politicians, our leaders, our activists, are they concerned about that? Or are they concerned about getting the Republican Party elected? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly there's that. But I just thought I would start off this show with just a little bit of history. Because there are entirely far too many people for my taste, entirely too many people for my taste who don't understand the history. And if you don't know the history and if you don't know the lay of the land, how are you going to grow the party? How are you going to grow the base? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, another conversation that we had, uh, one huge problem, massive problem that I find with our fellow, some of our, not all, but some of our fellow Republicans is that they like to preach to the choir. Mm. Okay, how much adulation, praise, giddy applause do you need? Y you have to go out and speak with people who might not hold your point of view. But maybe if you talk to the person enough and engage with the person enough, maybe uh, an alliance can be formed. Maybe a friendship can be formed. Or at the very least, a mutual respect can grow. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's very important. And I think that that's key to growing the party. It's not just preaching to the choir. That, I mean, Repu you know, the Republicans who are Republicans who are active, they're set. But you have to go out to people who would never even think of being Republican. And, and, and that's if you're ready, I think, to go to the people who would probably present the biggest challenge, then you're ready, truly ready to grow the party. What would you say to that? Well, I think, uh, I think that's true. I think the important thing is that people have to be uh, educated and understand what the parties represent. And uh, you know, if you go to most people today and say, well, What's the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? The Republicans are for the rich and the Democrats are for the poor. So you have guys like uh, Bill Gates. He's not exactly a poor man. He's no, a Democrat. Not, not exactly. Uh, John he, Kerry. John Kerry. Uh, well, and, although Bill Gates earned his money. Right, right. Um, John so, Kerry married it. Oops. Yeah. So, so <laughs> well, and then he divorced it and married some more. And I mean, whatever. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not true that the Republican Party is the party of, of the rich. Uh, I'm not rich. Oh, I'm certainly so, not either, so. <laughs> um, you know, if I could be rich, I think I'd rather be a Republican. Uh, to me, being a Republican is somebody of principle, and I try and convey that when I talk to people. So I go out and I talk to voters. I, I talk to a lot of voters. I'm one of those people that stands outside the polling place. Democratic voters are very different from Democratic activists. Republican voters tend to be a little bit closer to Republican activists. To me, they better understand um, issues and, and so on. There are a lot of Democrats that, that understand issues, that are very passionate. They care deeply about the things that the Democratic Party represent. 
But I talk to an awful lot of uh, voters that have no clue about issues at all. They've just been told to vote. They're unenrolled, but they every time they go in, they pick up a, a, a Democratic ballot. Well, people vote do that. vote. I mean, I, I think that people do vote out of habit, like we were just saying a little bit earlier. And people vote for what they know and what they hear. And if they're hearing it at home or their friends oh. going to school at, at the job. The Boston Globe treats Republicans as if it was a disease. If you want to make the right choice, it has to be as a Democrat. So that, that's a real burden to go up against in society. And you get that not just from the Boston Globe and the news media, but you get it in culture. It Absolutely. comes in mo movies and it comes on television programs. So people that pay no attention to the newspapers anymore, I don't know if anybody really does that, that I mean, I, even I'm too young to read a newspaper. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, if you're just watching television, you're being told not what the issues are, but that you should vote Democrat. And that's a tough thing for Republicans well, to go up against. It is. And I think that, you know, we can talk a little bit about this more later, but I, I think that that's another reason why we need to encourage and support credible, credible mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Republican and or conservative, or, you know, if not both, voices um, in the media because we just, not only do we need a balance on Beacon Hill, that's become the popular uh, cri de coeur, you know, the popular, popular rallying cry. But we also need it in media, too. And I'll give you an example, uh, which is Jim Brody. Mm -hmm. And recently, uh, Senator Hedlund was on. And I like Senator Hedlund. He's, he's, he, you know, the little I've interacted with him, he seems very, you know, very likable, comes across very affable man. Um, and, I, and I think he's done a lot of great work. Uh, he's um, done a lot for his constituents. And yet, I remember one part of the interview that he had with Jim Brody, this recent interview, Brody said, okay, well, you're not a typical Republican. He said something along those lines. And I was hoping that Hedlund would find kind of um, a firm but gentle way of saying, now, come on, Mr. Brody, or even maybe a joke, well, you're not the typical you know, TV journalist. You know, just something, because again, you know, you're being bombarded with this idea that if you're a Republican, that's somehow, you're not really in touch, or you're not really compassionate, or you're not really ready or able to speak to the issues. And so, you know, we have one minute before we go to our first break. But what I want to start discussing is, okay, so we've given the history of the state, the city, the state. But the, the reality today is that the Democrats are very much in control. And as we just got through say, saying, everywhere around us is saying, vote Democrat, or the Democrats are presented in a better light. So why would you want to be then a Republican activist? It's one thing to be a, a, a voter, you know, registered Republican. But you're actually, you're an activist, you do a lot, and you're also a consultant. Why? Because there's a threat that's occurring in our society today. And there's a corruption in Massachusetts that is not typical of every state. It, every government has a level of corruption in it, but Beacon Hill is, is really something. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore this topic a little bit more after we get back from our first break. Uh, we are taking calls. If you would like to call in, the number is 617-708-3280. Thank you so much. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at Mommy. Maybe the light hurts his ass. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Ooh. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase.
Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. Hi, my name is Rachel Meiselman, and you are watching Bostonian Rap. If you're just tuning in, oh, well, thank you, welcome, and hello. <laughs> I'm here tonight with Rob Zazula. He is a Republican activist and consultant, and we're discussing a myriad of issues surrounding the Republican Party, issues that we both actually don't think are addressed or discussed nearly enough. So just before we went to break, Ralph, uh, we were talking about your activism. Uh, you are involved in a number of different projects, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, you're also a consultant. I know that you've worked on a number of campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, all different levels, um, you know, from municipal all the way to congressional. Some people might say, okay, well, based on what I know and based on the picture that Rachel just presented and the picture that you too presented and agree, you know, you, you know, we're all in agreement, you know, studio, you know, the audience, you know, Rachel, me, yeah. why would you even bother being a Republican activist? Why so, would you even bother being a consultant? So there's two parts to that. Uh, one is why a Republican and the other is why an activist? So let me take the Republican piece first. Okay. I, I mentioned that I had uh, come from a Democratic background, uh, had something that, that caused me to question and really began to look at things that I had been taught to find out for myself. What I found was that uh, the United States government is, is exceptional. Uh, I know that people like to think that every country is exceptional, but they're not. <laughs> America, the United States, believes that government should be limited not to interfere with what people want to do. They should be allowed to reach for the heights, do whatever they can be, be the best there is, all, all those corny things. But usually what happens in government is government begins to trample over, trample over people's uh, uh, lives. And America set up a government to not allow that. And as I began to look at that type of government, I was thrilled with it. I said, this is great. Government's limited, people can perform, the state has its role, the feds have their role, everything fit in. So I like that. And that's what being a Republican meant, so I became a Republican. The Democratic alternative was bigger government, bigger government programs. You can't do for yourself. We're going to do it for you. And you know whether you look at the USSR or any other examples from history, that doesn't always work out well. The promises come up short. So I reached a point where I was a Republican. I said, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm a Republican. There's not much of a reason to be active anymore. The Democrats are winning. I can't do a whole lot to change that. I'm going to take the easy way out. And I did take several years where I was not very involved in politics. And then you look around and you see people being hurt by programs. And you see programs that are failing. And you see the corruption. And you can't stay on the sidelines for very long. If you care at all. Yeah. I, and, and so you, you, you start wondering about um, what is your role as a citizen? Uh, what's your role as a human being? Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a city person. I'm a Chelsea person. I saw people that needed help from government and it was there for them. And I saw people that were able to rise above that and achieve on their own. Sometimes, you know, help is better when it comes from a church than it comes from a, a government. And if you want to really care, the place to do it is, is probably better to do it in, in a church rather than in a government agency. But that's not where we're, we are today. No. Um, we have massive government, and in order to prevent it from getting worse and having people know less and less and be uh, less able to participate as citizens, what are you going to do? So I have gotten out and gotten involved and tried to make a difference. And I've, I've served on, um, I've lived in small towns and served on local boards uh, trying to prevent uh, uh, corruption in, in a small town basis. I've lived in cities and, and participated there. Uh, just moved to Framingham and I'll, as, the longer I'm in Framingham, the more involved I'll get in that community uh, because I have a role in the local community as well as to the state. Is it tempting to think about living in uh, Texas as a Republican where you can actually win without a whole lot of effort? Uh, That's it, it, no fun, it, no challenge. It, well, yeah, but, but I live here. <laughs> uh, I could deal with a little less of a, a, 
of a challenge sometimes. I, I know. I, I, I actually like the challenge. Um, I wouldn't want, you know, it to be easy. And also, it's my home. It's my home. And, and I know that there are enough people out there who would be willing to listen if we were just willing to talk to them. Yep. And just to speak to something that you said about uh, big government, what I've also noticed is, you know, you have all these different programs that have sprung up and they're actually demanding government help. And these different programs, they function a little more than vanity vehicles. Now, when there are problems in the community, you do have people who stand up and I don't want to slight you know, anybody, you know, I don't want to insult people and, and come across as that I don't appreciate the efforts of some people in the community because there are some people who've done remarkable things to help people who are in need and who are hurting. But I, but I have found, I've been going to a lot of different town hall meetings, you know, because of course Boston has a new mayor and I think he'll do a great job and, and I really like the idea of, of these town hall meetings. But I've been listening to a lot of people stand up and say, we need this, we need that. And what's interesting to me is that they're essentially asking for the government to get involved in their endeavors. And they're talking about basically, basically making excuses. That's what it comes down to, making excuses for the problems. There's no kind of personal responsibility. Uh, there's no kind of initiative. And I just, I don't see how that's going to take us in the right direction. It's not that... I'm against organizations and groups and grassroots efforts that help people. I mean, everyone needs help at some point. I'm, not, I'm definitely not lacking in compassion, but I think that if we have groups that spring up and they're asking for government intervention and government funding, and there's no kind of balance, you're asking for help from the government, but you're not talking about personal responsibility at any point, what does that mean for the community? Well, yeah, you, know, you know, every problem the, the, that you there, have, it's someone else's fault? Do you there, there are a lot of different organizations out there, and I'll look at a new organization and, you know, feeding the, hung, feeding the hungry. Uh, whether they're poor or not doesn't even matter. If somebody's hungry and you've got some food, feed them. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. So if an organization comes along and they're feeding the poor, uh, and they have a, a kitchen, and they're providing food, and they're gathering up the resources, and people are volunteering their time to help out. Great. Now, if you have an organization that is soliciting the government to increase their programs, in other words, they're not actually feeding anyone. Or oh, they're hoping they're, for funding, some kind of funding. They're, not, they're saying, give us money so that we can lobby the government to spend more money on the poor. They're not feeding anyone. And yet, those government programs today are probably feeding more people than the truly caring programs are. We've let it slip away. It used to mean if you were a caring person, you fed somebody who was hungry. You took care of somebody who was poor. You saw somebody who didn't have a jacket, and you gave them a jacket. Today, that's not true. You look at the person without a jacket, and you go, I'm going to call my legislator and tell him I saw a person with no jacket. That's a, that's a very different type right. of, of, of care. No, absolutely. Believe me, I, I am very compassionate, and I think everyone should be given a chance. People should be given breaks. And these are very difficult economic times, so maybe I should have been more specific. I'm thinking about, and you've touched upon it anyway, but I'll be specific to the people who, uh, for the people who are watching. You know, I'm talking about um, grassroots efforts uh, surrounding our children's education, mm -hmm. uh, things along those lines. You know, you're asking for help. You're asking for um, additional opportunities for our youth. Yes, that would be a great idea, but are you using the existing opportunities? No, you're not. And also, I, again, I don't hear anything about personal responsibility. That has to figure in there somewhere. I mean, it's, oh, well, they don't have access. Oh, they, it, it, but it's, you can't just ask. You have to, I think there should be a balance. You ask, but then you also say to yourself, okay, I'm asking for help because I want to be independent and I want to eventually give back. So I'm not hearing any of that either. And for me, those are also ideas related to republicanism. 
you know, personal responsibility. I think it plays a particularly strong, or it's a particularly strong um, part of the core values. It's, it figures prominently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, we have a, a situation today. We're not teaching personal responsibility. No. We're not teaching much for values and principles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a shame. When, when you're dealing with education, and education is something that's important to us, uh, my wife works in, in a public school system, and so we talk about uh, public schools every single day. But uh, uh, the schools involve a student, a teacher, and parents. Parents, yeah, they parents all, have to do something. They all have roles. So does the student. The stu if, <laughs> if the students are not performing well, you know, you, you can say, well, the schools need to do more. They need to spend more money. They need this. They need smaller class sizes. You've got to stop by letting the, the kids know that they have to do the work. They have to perform. And parents, I, I didn't wait for my kids to go to school before uh, I started teaching them. I started making sure they knew things. Sometimes, some of the things they learned in school I didn't necessarily agree with. And I made sure my kids understood that there was always a need to think about what anybody said. Even if, even if I was telling my kids, they weren't supposed to take what I said as, as the truth. They were to, to go research it and find out for themselves and learn. Teach somebody how to think, not what to know. Right. And, and we're, we're letting down in that area, and it's, it, it is a difference. Not every parent, by the way, is going to uh, perform as well as I may have as a, as a parent. And there are going to be some that did better. But as, uh, as our society, as a, as a local uh, uh, city or town, we have to be concerned about how do we help out the parents that aren't able to, to do a great job. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's one thing um, if people honestly need help. Mm -hmm. But again, I have to go back to personal responsibility and personal initiative. And, and I also have to clarify to my Democrat friends, I'm not trying to say that personal responsibility isn't important to you. <laughs> uh, you know, because I know a lot of people, uh, you know, talking about personal responsibility, it's a theme that can resonate with a lot of different people. Um, but all I'm trying to say is that Again, I think it's particularly important for Republicans because we're asking the government to play as little role as possible in our lives. And so what does that mean? It means that we are assuming a responsibility, a bigger responsibility for how our life turns out and the decisions that we make and the consequences that come along with them. So I'd like to talk about your voter ID efforts. Sure. But first, we're going to go to our next break. Uh, I hope that you will tune in, continue to tune in. Again, if you have any questions uh, for either myself or my great guest, Rob Zazula, you can reach us at 617-708-3280. Thank you. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Being a dad can be tough. No, no, no. What do you mean she's not coming? When's the fairy princess coming? Any minute now. <laughs> but when you're willing to do anything... It is I, Cruz. Zinc or Bell? Yeah. Okay, time for cake. It's always yeah. worth it. I know it's really you, Bro. I'm just pretending for the other kids. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4-DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.com. Hello. Uh, once again, you are watching Bostonian Rap. My name is Rachel Meiselman. I have been talking with Rav Zazula tonight. He is a Republican activist and consultant. So just before we went to break, uh, I talked about your efforts relating to voter ID. And I had actually alluded to it before we went to our last break, but let's really try to get into it right now. So I believe uh, you have really you know, done a lot. Um, your project is show ID to vote. Correct. If you want to vote, uh, show it. Right, and, and 
we looked at that a couple of ways. When we uh, first started, it was 2010. Uh, I was working for a congressional candidate who didn't survive the primary. And uh, Was that Tom Weaver? Tom Weaver. And okay. so Tom and I sat there and we said, well, how are these candidates going to win now in November? Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. And we thought, well, you know, we saw in past elections and in uh, times that we were at the polls that the Democrats have an advantage because they're cheating. <laughs> don't, don't mince your words. What, what, what do you want to say you have, here? <laughs> you have people that are coming in and voting on behalf of, uh, let's say, family members or people that don't actually exist. And we said, well, how can we have an impact in a, in a few months? And we said, well, what if we pushed people to show an ID when they went to vote? And uh, so we said, even though the law doesn't require that you show your, your driver's license, do it anyway. And if people see people showing an identification, maybe it'll, it'll get somebody nervous and maybe we can affect the numbers of people that are cheating. Well, the idea kind of caught on and it began to grow into some different things. And, and what did it become? Well, we, we became an educational operation where we take information and provide it to activists all over the country uh, principally in Massachusetts. We got very familiar with Massachusetts election law. And uh, one uh, uh, kind of uh, example that we set is we went into a polling place on election day, set up video cameras, and captured every single person who voted uh, at a precinct. And uh, the point in doing that was, well, people said, well, you're trying to scare the vote away. Well, I, I guess if you're a fraudulent voter, and you're about to be videotaped, you might think twice uh, about it. But, you know, it was, a, it was an election. It was a, an election. What we were videotaping was an election that had very little consequence. There wasn't going to be a lot of cheating. It was a special election. It was very low turnout. So we weren't there trying to suppress anybody. We were there trying to prove that you could, under mass law, videotape a polling precinct. And of course, the authorities allowed us to do it. We set it up. We videotaped the whole day. And then we announced to the world, you could do this at every single polling precinct. In other words, I mean, what you're, you were essentially, you and Tom were trying to do, are trying to do, is just basically put fraudulent voters on, on alert. You know, we're not going to let you do this. We're going to. Well, if, if we had combat a what video you're trying to do. On, on every precinct, the number of people that, I mean, we have polling officials that are wonderful and honest. And by the way, we have pretty good voter laws. If they were enforced in this state, we don't have a photo ID requirement. And, uh, and, and I don't think you, you really need it. I, I think that you need to verify who the voter is when they okay. come in. Okay, and that, I think that's important for people to hear. Under mass law, somebody comes in, the polling official does not have to ask them for proof of who they are. And what is proof? I mean, if you're walking in with your dad and you're a brand new voter and you don't drive and so you don't have a photo ID, but the dad's like, my son's voting for the first time, I think it's pretty clear that that can verify who that voter is. Okay. So I think there's a lot of different ways that we can verify. And under mass law, you can use utility bills and, right. and mail and all kinds of things. And all of those will work, and, and they'll work just fine. And, and I think it's important that you... you Again, that you're saying all this, that you're saying that one way to verify a voter's identity is with utility bills, because I've listened to both sides. I try to do that, you know, in every situation. And a lot of people would say, you're racist. A lot of people say that Republicans in general are racist, that they are trying to disenfranchise uh, people, primarily voters of color. Uh, as well as people who are poor. Well, what would you say to that? Well, first of all, there, there are some Republicans out there that are not real Republicans. They don't care about principles. They don't care about limited government or government intrusion. They're Republicans because that works for them politically, and that maybe they can get their brother-in-law a contract or whatever it is. They, they, they're not a real solid Republican. And there are going to be some of those that are going to say, look, I, I don't have time to get to know the voters, so how do I... How do I dissuade people that aren't going to vote for me? Well, maybe I'll, I'll dissuade the poor and the blacks and this and that. Th that's, that's a horrific thing when it happens, but it's not the normal case. 
Uh, the reason that you want voter ID is, is for the obvious things, to cut down on the fraud that is going on. But like I say, in Massachusetts, if we don't change the, the law on what can be used as an ID, but we do ask polling officials to uh, say to somebody, well, you know, how do we know you are who you are? What would most people do in this state? They take out their license. That's right. And they show it. Now, I, I've been in polling places like Lawrence and Lowell. And you're, you're, when somebody in this state is voting for the first time at a voting location, they've moved, they've changed um, uh, houses, they've changed cities, they're in it. They have to show an ID the first time they vote. Whether it's a piece of meal or it's a driver's license, they have to show it. And I've watched, it's very different when you live in a, a town like Concord where nobody ever moves. You move into a house, you're there for the rest of your life. And then when you go to vote, you vote at the same precinct every single time. You know the people that are there. Sure. Well, you go into Lawrence, and you have somebody who's moved three times since the last election, been married, divorced, had, had name changes, address changes. They don't have any documentation with a, a picture on it that has their current name, let alone their current address. And the polling officials can work through all of that, figure out who that person is, and get them to vote, and deal with it great. Current laws, it works. It's the people that are supposed to show identification and they don't ask. I just moved to Framingham and I went into the town where I lived and I said, I'm not going to be here anymore. Take my name off the voting roll. And the clerk said, we don't know where that form is. In other words, people aren't going in and removing their name. Hmm. So if the Democrats wanted to vote for me in that next election, it didn't work. I had my name removed. Then I went to Framingham, and I had all my uh, paperwork in line. I had my, my uh, passport. So you yourself show ID. You're not, it's not like you're asking others to, to do it. You know, the other, it's good for other people to do, but not myself. You're doing it, too. I, absolutely. I, I, w I went to vote in Framingham, and normally I just show my license because I want to make a point. Um, but now, moving into Framingham, I didn't do that. I went to register to vote. I didn't have to show any identification. I didn't have to show my uh, passport. I didn't have to show my redirected mail. All, everything that I had, they didn't, they didn't want to see any of it. Fill out the form. There you go. Thank you very much. You're a voter. And then when I went to vote, I know under the law they have to check my ID, first time voting in a location. It was right there on the, on the voter list, ask them for an ID, and they did not do it. That, now, that's interesting. It's, okay, so now we've addressed, you know, because, you know, I've heard people say, look, you know, people who are trying to do what you're doing, you know, push for voter ID, that's akin to Jim Crow laws. Now, I don't agree with that, but that's, you know, that's, I, that's what some people are saying. You responded to that. Yeah. Now, what about the other claim that fraudulent voting doesn't occur on a large enough scale for your efforts to be, you know, necessary. Well, I mean, if that was true, that, you know, you really don't need to do anything, people are basically honest, they're not going to cheat, we don't really need any polling officials at all. We can just leave a stack of ballots there, tell people, please take only one. <laughs> they do that for the Super Bowl, right? They do that for uh, the, the, uh, the, the all-star teams. You, sure. When you go to a game, you're supposed to take one ballot, pick who you want on third base, and put it in. But people take an entire stack because they can get away with it. The reason that they're not finding voter fraud in significant numbers is because they're not looking for it. There are officials, not every official, but there are officials that are uh, part of the fraud that's going on. They understand that the people that are coming in are not who they say they are. And they, they look the other way. And I've seen that occur. Uh, again, under Massachusetts law, you can only challenge for certain things. So I've, I've, I've dealt with that on a whole different way. Is there enough fraud to sway an election? Absolutely. Ask Scott Brown. I'm pretty sure he got more votes in the last election than Elizabeth Warren. But he's, that, not, no, that's he's interesting. not the senator today. Unfortunately. Uh, and, and, you know, we just, we just expanded with early, early voting. What, what Show ID to Vote does today is we encourage people to participate, not for a party, not for a candidate, but go out and as a citizen observe the election. 
If you're standing there and watching, your eyes are going to be open to what goes on. And you know, you're going to say, okay, I mean, I've seen people come in, try and vote. I challenged them, had the person turn around and run out. And then at the end of the day, that person who tried to cheat, they're listed as saying, well, there was no fraud. Okay. Well, that's the, we're going we're gonna to pick up with that. Uh, we're going to go to our next break now. We, uh, you mentioned Scott Brown. I'd like to talk about Scott Brown in our last segment, as well as uh, you know, one or two elections from uh, last year and GOP prospects for 2014. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Hi, thank you for joining us once again. My name is Rachel Meiselman, and you are watching Bostonian Rap. I have had a, a guest tonight, Rob Zazula. He's a Republican activist and consultant. Now, just before we went to break, you referenced Scott Brown. Um, let's talk a little bit about Scott Brown. Uh, he's no longer here. He put his home in Rentham up for sale, and he's now living in Rye, New Hampshire. I, uh, even, even when I had read about that, that he had put his home up for sale and that he was moving, I still held, held out hope that he was going to stay. Because I actually, I really appreciate a lot of things about Ralph, uh, uh, Scott Brown, excuse me. I, I have to be in full disclosure, I wasn't initially a fan but he earned my respect. And once he earned my respect, he had my loyalty. And so to this day, I'm very loyal to Scott Brown. You know, in, in our party, uh, we have a lot of uh, different factions, don't we? Mm. we <laughs> so we have people who are battling about uh, being conservative versus being moderate. And then even within the conservative faction, we have people battling about what is truly conservative, you know, what is truly conservative and what is not. And, and, and it just goes on and on and on. But I think Scott Brown was very good for Massachusetts. And he's just very good for Republicanism in general because it's, it's really, it's not about, in my opinion, voting for someone who is going to do everything that you want him or her to do. It's about someone who is going to respect the core values, but also go out there and, and, and put a reasonable, a logical, affable face on republicanism. And I think he can do that. And I, I think that he, he had to walk a fine line. I mean, he had to, as I just said, we have a lot of different factions in the Republican Party. Uh, you know, forget about surviving Democrats. We have to survive each other. <laughs> uh, so he had to appeal to all these different factions, as well as Democrats, whom he was also representing, and independents, and then other parties, you know, Green Rainbow. So really, I mean, he didn't have an easy job. No. Well, he ran as a Republican. He said he was a different kind of Republican. Um, but once he won, which was amazing, I, I mean, now, now he became a United States Senator of the people. And I think he truly tried to represent his constituents. He, even if he didn't agree with his constituents' views, he still considered them and tried to represent them. And so you do walk a fine line of, you know, do you, do you, uh, do you vote for your personal views? 
Scott could have been a great Democrat. Uh, he he was a he he was he is a, a, a great Republican because he's a, he's a caring, serious I think human he, being. I think he's a good person too. I really really do. He's not real constitutional. He's got a better understanding than you know maybe this Democrat or some other Republicans. But the fault uh, on Scott is not necessarily in in those areas. Uh, people want to define con uh, conservative as being like them. So if Scott's not like you are, well, then he's not conservative enough. And, and I'm conservative, and I know you are too, but I... But I, we have different views. But we, we don't, we but don't we, always, we have different right? views, absolutely. We're not ready to fight each other over them. But, you know, but we, as, as two conservative Republicans, we understand and respect that when Scott Brown was U.S. Senator, he wasn't in Washington just to represent us. Right. Now, why did we lose him? I mean, people think, well, he's going to New Hampshire because he can win up there. I'm not so sure Scott's going to have an easy time winning up there, but um, that may not be why he left. Scott's making some pretty serious money right now. Um, you know, he's, it, just uh, what he gets from Fox News, and he's got a lot of other uh, sources of income coming in. Well, I think he's an interesting man. He's an intelligent man, and you know he's he's uh, exercising his options. Why so not? Massachusetts, you take six percent of that right off the top, and in New Hampshire, zero. He may have moved to New Hampshire simply because it's a nice place to live. It's a lot cheaper, and he can. You know, if I'm living in in the neighborhood of this studio, and I want to move to New Hampshire, that's not so easy. Uh, I may not be able to do it. My job isn't going to follow me. The opportunities that I have here are going to be different up in New Hampshire. Right. And I may not just have the money to decide to change. Scott may have fled to New Hampshire because it simply makes more sense for his family. And it may have less to do with politics than we can imagine. I don't know, but it, it really is a loss to not have. have oh, it's Scott a tremendous state. loss, and uh, uh, you know, in, in full disclosure, once again, uh, since we're being honest, right? Always honest, or try to be as often as possible. I'm sorry he didn't run for governor. I think he would have been a fantastic I, candidate. I, I would have loved if he had uh, watched the vote on election day and had been recognized as the winner. Uh, Scott, like I say, Scott got more votes in in that. Uh, race, more legitimate votes. And people say, well, there's not really that much fraud. There's a lot of fraud in a lot of places. But, I, but you know, let me, let me say something about the fraud. I, I think the biggest fraud is, is not even something that's illegal. It's just wrong. We have people that are going to the polls, and uh, they don't understand what it means to be a liberal, conservative, Republican. Is that true, right? They don't know who the candidates are or what they really stand for. They're not prepared to participate, and they do. And that's not against the law, but it is a fraud. And that's the fraud that's really hurting us, not the people that are voting more times than they're supposed well, to. Well, I, I can't speak to the people who are voting more times than they should, or if Scott actually you know, got more votes than Elizabeth Warren, ultimately. I am sorry that he's no longer our US mm -hmm. senator, um, but I was still holding out hope afterwards that he would run for governor. That didn't happen. Um, but I will say this kind of on a last note, and then I want to move on to another one of our uh, topics in this last segment. I, I find it very interesting that there are some, speaking of different factions in the Republican Party, that you have some Republicans who are saying that we need to reach out to minority voters. And so we need a minority to do it. And what I find ironic is that Scott Brown has reached out to all kinds of different people, union people, minority people. He was right, he was right in Grove Hall. He was in Grove Hall. And there are actually a lot of Democrats who don't go in there. But Scott Brown did. And so I'm thinking, well, let's see. Last time I checked, Scott Brown's a white man. <laughs> you know, you don't, I, what I'm trying to say is you don't need a particular type of person, look at, you know, a person of a particular background to appeal to a particular group. What you need is someone who's just willing to take that message around. And so I think that we can learn a lot from different things that Scott Brown did. Um, again, it's a shame that uh, for the moment he's not, um, a, a, like I think, uh, um, a figure, a, 
particularly big figure in Massachusetts politics, um, but we'll see what happens down the road. Now, we had a couple of interesting elections. So we had a few last year, um, and I know that recently uh, Sean Dooley won, mm -hmm. so he will be... In a very... Uh, Scott Brown's old... Right. See, and, and a very Republican district. Right. Uh, well, uh, Dan Winslow, I believe. Yeah, Correct. Dan Winslow, who's, who's wonderful. And so now it's Sean Dooley, so that's wonderful. Um, you know, of course, the race, you know, the campaigning was last year, and the vote was just very recently. And I believe the swearing-in ceremony will be on the 22nd. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll just kind of skip right into... Um, starting off with Sean Dooley's win, which is wonderful. He seems like a very nice person, and I think he's going to do a good job. Um, do you think that's a harbinger of to come? Do you do you think that no, well, he, Sean Dooley won, so you know we're off you know, to a good start? First, first of all, Sean's a good-looking man. I'm not uh, I'm not trying to let anybody think I'm attracted to men. I'm happily married. But, <laughs> uh, but, but he's your, a good-looking man. Your, your he, beautiful wife, he's Michelle, a, is he's very, a, I'm he's sure a very sure to hear that. Yeah, he's a Republican. He ran in a, a, a Republican district. Uh, we've got to have some numbers somewhere. Uh, it is great to see him win. I, you know, I get nervous. It's like, how bad can things get? Right. You, I mean, you don't want to take away from his efforts, but, right. it, but it, you know, it, it did help um, that it is a Republican you know, you, area, Republican-leaning area. Democrats district. could have been more effective in that. They, they schedule these special elections as best they can to maximize their advantages. People don't participate. It's such small numbers that anything can happen. But it was good to see Sean win, and, he, and he's a good candidate. Hopefully, you know, it doesn't take a lot to fight the corruption on, on Beacon Hill. Once you're a Republican, you're already on the outs, so you don't have to worry <laughs> about what size your office is, is going to be. And I uh, and it's great to see uh, uh, him heading up to Beacon Hill to do battle. Absolutely, I'm excited, and I hope I'll see you at the swearing-in ceremony. Oh, I don't know. That's <laughs> you know, I don't I don't go to the partying aspects. I uh, I'll be out there and work in the trenches, but I have uh, other things to do with that time. And and by the way, you know, uh, politics is not the biggest part of my life. There are other things that are are more important, but you tend to keep them separate. And politics shouldn't be the biggest part of anybody's life. Right? If, if you are out there being a human being, you are involved in all kinds of other things, in family and whatnot. Okay, uh, so on a last quick note, so you're not necessarily going to take Sean Dooley's victory in the 9th Norfolk District as kind of um, an omen for what's to come. Um, but you know, I guess like one of the, the biggest races and, and that's not to say I don't think that all the other races shouldn't be paid attention to because you know me and I think oh. that they should. But, you know, most people are going to be paying attention to the gubernatorial race. Yep. So we have Charlie Baker. We have, um, it's not a new and improved Charlie Baker. It's, I guess, it's the real Charlie Baker. What, what, do, you, what do you think of that really quick as we get, to wrap, uh, we get ready to well, wrap up? I like, uh, there's things I like a lot about Charlie, and I'm, I'm a Republican delegate to the convention, and I've already committed to Charlie, because nobody's going to come along that's going to be viable, that's going to be better than Charlie. And Charlie's got a great background. He's an executive. He knows how to run an organization. He knows how to hire and fire people. He'll make Good. a great governor. All right. Well, we also have Mark Fisher, who's running, who's another Republican candidate. But he's candidate. not viable. Well, well, we'll see. Um, if people want to reach out to you, uh, it's um, on Twitter. It's R Zazula Z A Z U L A, and or, or the Mad GOP Hatter, because they they call me the Mad Hatter, uh, because I I won't uh, just give people what they want to hear. I have a tendency to tell it the way it All is. Right. Thank you so much, Ralph, for joining me tonight. Please join me in uh, two weeks' time, January 31st. Thank you for tuning in tonight. This has been Bostonian Rap, and I am Rachel Meiselman.